Lord, we thank you for this time, and you've called us to uh, explore and understand uh, the truths of your word and apply them in our lives. We ask for the grace for that application in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we've been exploring the uh, book of Job, and as you can see, uh, there was a conflict in Job's life at the first two chapters. He did not understand why it was happening, just that it was happening. And uh, there was the rest of the book. The bulk, bulk of the book is devoted, devoted to these uh, attempts to find some kind of a meaningful answer as to why these things are actually occurring because it's impossible to really be sure. And so we have all these cycles of debate, but it gets worse and worse and there's more and more heat and less and less light as the time goes by. And then God himself is the one who breaks in when you're looking at this book, this architecture is that something happens. We don't know why it's happening to us, but it's happening. We all have ex this experience, don't we? And you can't figure it out. And you're, then you're trying to figure out why it's happening. And every time, if God were to give you an answer, you'd have, that would not actually satisfy you. Then you'd want another answer to understand that answer. And then that would raise another question, and you'd want to have another answer ad infinitum. You'd go, you'll never go there. Here's why because you can't get it to begin with. It's impossible. You cannot try to understand it. And this is what I've been using nature to illustrate uh, the glory of God in this book, because as we've been uh, seeing, there are certain things that seem impossible for us to grasp apart from the uh, glory of God. I'm going to be showing you one of those things. But when I, when I look at any kind of flower will do, anything at all, and you want to unpack the mystery of any of these flowers and the uniqueness and the diversity and the beauty and, and that biology, you would never be able to understand one of the cells in that, let alone the entire uh, of that. And that's just a, a flower. And then you go higher up with insects and then animals and so forth. And I'm going to, my intention is to show you some wonderful creatures and wonderful things that actually boggle the imagination and illustrate the very point of this book that if you, you can't understand the natural world, if I have shown, if I spoke to you of earthly things and you cannot comprehend, why do you suppose you'd understand if I spoke to you of spiritual things? You see, it's even higher level. If I spoke to you about, for example, uh, the nature of this world in terms of energy, no one knows what energy is, yet spirit is what called energy into being. The whole thing, in other words, is entirely mysterious, and we are immersed in that mystery of God that shows us from the created order that we should actually have understood it this way. This wonderful Elizabeth Barrett Browning poem that I keep quoting keeps coming to my mind because earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes, the rest sit round and pluck blackberries. That's a good summary of our situation. The visible world and what God has made, not what we've made, but what God has made. Pick anything you want. Any leaf will do. Any insect, uh, any flower, any fish. It gets more, more bigger and more complex it gets, the more amazing it becomes. You can't grasp it. I'll show you a video to illustrate that. The fact is that we can't grasp the, the fringe of his ways and we're in being invited by God then to say, I'm the one who made all these things. You're going to have to learn to trust in me. I'm the one who actually created these things, this unity out of diversity. And this is a video of, about this. It's a Japanese puffer fish. And it's the most intriguing little creature because you see this creature then, um, this is from a BBC Earth presentation, but check out what this pufferfish does. Unfortunately, this small Japanese pufferfish is dull, almost to the point of invisibility. But to compensate, he is probably nature's greatest artist. To grab a female's attention, he creates something that almost defies belief. His only tools are his fins. In his head, a plan of mathematical perfection.
He plows the sand, breaking it up into the finest of particles. These shells aren't just rubbish to be removed. He uses them to decorate the bridges of his construction. He can't rest for more than a moment, but must work 24 hours a day for a week, or the current will destroy his creation. A final tidy up, and his masterpiece is complete. in nature does an animal construct something as complex and perfect as this. If this doesn't get him noticed, nothing will. He's just taken the sublime and reduced it to the, to the trivial. This is not just to get a mate. This is gratuitous beauty. This is so far beyond what is necessary. And all a materialist can do is say, it's for just so we can get a mate. Nonsense. There are so many other ways of doing that, and we know that works much more easily. What are we looking at? Go behold what you're seeing. Or, or what I like about this is that they don't reveal what he's creating at first. But you'll notice that at first you see him. He's got a happy little face, hopeful eyes. You know, we kind of attribute that. But he looks. Uh, he's, he's using his fins, and you'll see he's using his dorsal fin. And you see that that fin is the only thing it's touching. You see, the rest of it. It's a perfect height. He does not actually swim above, how am I doing? You see, he's creating something that's a marvel. It's a masterpiece. In fact, what he's creating is this. And you can see the fish right there. You see the puffer fish right there? And uh, he's created this wonder. He doesn't even know what he's making. But it's perfect. It's exquisite in its structure and its layout. The complexity makes, it reminds me actually quite a bit of these rose windows. You see? Because there's a very real similarity in that structure and in that complexity. Very similar indeed. There's an inside out, a, a kind of a double level a kind of a way of seeing it. And so when we look at those windows and we see those structures in, this, in God's world, that, that we've made rather, in God's world, this is, this is a rose window with exquisite design. So what I'm suggesting as I look at this marvel this wonder, is that how is it possible? What information, how can this fish have that biological information? It's in its brain, but he doesn't even know what he's doing, but it's instinctual. So he's creating this, he plows it up, and then they show, you see how it kind of slides along, perfect height, and he does this for a couple of weeks and makes a marvelous thing. So you tell me, and then he, then he, makes, he takes this little rocks and he actually, actually decorates his, his material, as you, as you noticed. So here he puts it there. Oh, I think I'll put this one right there. So what gives him the ability to do that? We're seeing marvels that no one else even knew about before. Well, I had a dream not long ago. Uh, not, not a dream, actually. It was a wake-up dream. It was like I was in a shower, and I had a kind of a revelation. This image came to mind. I saw this, this would have done it too, but this image uh, and this image came to my mind. And I was, I was reflecting on certain things that were happening. 
I was, it was as, as if God was saying, if you can understand how I created that creature and made him do that, then I'll tell you why you're having troubles in your life. Do you see the point there? That's the answer to Job. So that when God speaks to Job then, who is this who darkens counsel with words without knowledge? He asks him about 77 questions, and not one of them refers to the pain he's been going through. Not one refers to this three cycles of debate and then Elihu kind of sorting it out. But rather, it's tell, asking Job questions. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Do you know how to create these things? When the morning stars sang together, see, in an image of the angels rejoicing in God's creation as he spoke and sung it into being, creating uh, matter and energy, space and time in a way that we can even begin to understand. He starts with the inanimate world and speaks about clouds and uh, his power and of the, of the, the, the light and, this, and so forth, this, the seas and the, the, the frost and the, all these things, the storehouses of the hail. And then after he goes from there, he then begins to speak and he speaks of the stars as well, the Pleiades and the chords of Orion. And can you do that? Can you guide the bear with her satellites and so forth? Or who gave you understanding to be able to do this? And then he speaks about the animals and the various uh, uh, creatures that he has made. And he asks them a series of questions about the wild donkey and about the, um, the, the ostrich. And he takes great pleasure. Did you notice this and notice that? I've made this and it, I did it for my good pleasure. And he speaks about the war horse and other creatures. And then Job finally responds and he says, what can I say? I realize I'm speaking to one who is incomprehensible. I close my mouth, but that's not the response God wanted, was it? Because Job needed to acknowledge that and repent of his presumption that he could judge God and have an answer that, that, Job, that God couldn't, if I only had an umpire, then I would win over you? What nonsense that is, what arrogance. So he had to repent. So God gives him another array, speaks about these extraordinary creatures, Behi Be Be Leviathan and Behemoth. And then after speaking about those creatures and his ability to control the uncontrollable, then finally Job responds correctly. And uh, he says, I know that you can do all things. And he then says, I spoke things too wonderful for me, things I did not know. And others I spoke about, I was out of court even, even questioning your wisdom in doing this. Here now, and I'll speak, I'll answer. He says, now I retract and repent in dust and ashes. And that's the response that we have to make. So when we try to sort out why did God allow this cancer to happen? Or why did this person die? Or why did this happen at this time? Or what, what about these people here? Do you suppose God's going to actually sit at the court of your reason and give you an answer that you're going to understand? If you can't understand the simplest things in the created order, you're certainly not going to understand this. I'll give you another example of what I'm referring to. Because all I can hope to do is to layer and layer a few things that we now know from the world that were not known at the time when Job was asked those questions. So this is why I speak about Job 38 to 42 and modern science, because here, when we're looking at that, we remember we're looking at the visible realm. And the visible realm, what does it do? It points beyond itself to the invisible, so that God speaks about himself for those who have, to, have the eyes to see, the ears to hear. And that then points to his special revelation and the special revelation is the inspired word of God, which points to the incarnate word who now indwells us, the indwelling word. And so his, we have a vastly greater knowledge of the creation, vastly greater than was ever conceived of in the time of the writings of the scriptures. And given that, one of the things I'd like as a scientist is actually to be able to uh, help you get a picture of the wonder and the glory of the one that we serve by leveraging the created world to actually help us understand that in a different way. And that's why I'm showing you various things of this nature. These little, the scale of the universe we talked about. The, we talked about the inner life of the cell and how the cell itself is beyond comprehension. 
we can't even begin. The more we learn, the more astonishing it becomes. I showed you a dandelion vi video in the Malaysian orchid uh, that I've been studying. By. The wonderful things, um, these beautiful creatures uh, I'd also like to show you. It's just, a, I'm just, all I'm trying to do right now is simply to give you an impression is what I'm seeking to do, you see. And this idea of seeing then what this looks like, let me see if I can hear it. This video here, it gets an impression about the wonders of the one who made all things. Now look at this crazy looking thing. How do you create something that will just perfectly emulate an, a, a leaf like this? It's all or nothing. If you had a little a leafy appendage that just came along because after all it was a mutation, um, natural selection would eliminate it because it has no survival value. You'd have to have the entire thing working all at once or, or it just wouldn't work at all. Again, it, uh, it boggles the imagination, but they work perfectly in the way they adapt in the natural world.
incredible. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. So you can see then that these are just, again, illustrations of something that is uh, quite remarkable. When I think about um, this, uh, this whole area of moving art, there's, a, uh, there's something on Netflix I'd like to recommend you're considering to see. And I use this by way of worship, actually. So um, there's a whole series of these, and they are um, Louis uh, uh, Schwartzberg um, has done this wonderful drone photography and also a time-lapse photography, beautiful stuff. And I could pick any one of these things, but um, it, and it's, so it's, it's, but under, in Netflix, it's called Moving Art. And so there's three seasons of it, and it's well worth your looking at. I'll, I'll probably comment about that again. But if I go to uh, Underwater, for example, here, and then if I had Oceans here, and then grab that little guy there, and then play this thing here. So you and so this is worship for me. When I look at the natural world and this beauty that uh, is well-crafted and illustrates this, and you see the intensity and the complexity of this underground world that has its own rules we can't even begin to grasp. And you see the, the, the biodiversity that pleases God, the jellyfish, and you can see these exquisite things. One of my favorite things to see in an aquarium is always the jellyfish, as they, they amaze me. So when you see this, and then the, the corals as well, uh, so exquisite nature of these, it's like, again, like plants, they're, they're like, um, flowers and animals and so forth, but underwater, it's its own environment, its own realm, its own world, so that there's a gratuitous beauty that abounds throughout the world. Look at the exquisite nature of these fish, and you see how they work with the, uh, the corals there, and the little, uh, the ends of it. So again, wonderful marvels that are found in, the, in, the, uh, in this world, in this uh, world that he's created here. Um, there's also uh, the uh, underwater one as well, and uh, this is another one I like so much. So this is, again, something I would recommend for your consideration, but just go to Netflix Moving Art. And for me, when I watch these videos, it's worship, because what, what are you doing? You're amplifying, you're leveraging what we see in, the, in God's created world, and you can see what mind could make these kinds of creatures, you see. The, the glory of this, the wonder, these urchins and other creatures that he's made that give him pleasure. And, and, and frankly, many of these we didn't even know existed. And the further down you go, the more amazing it becomes. And so the world is filled with these wonderful uh, marvels that we can behold. You see how they undulate, and, but they're alive and there's a vibrancy and there's a, a, a complex systems all affecting one another. Everything's connected in that respect. And these, these glorious uh, beings that God has made, you see this, this creature here, how it emulates this, this coral, but it's, it's an animal. So you can see, again, these complex structures that God makes, symbiotic uh, structures that uh, he makes. This is one of my favorite things is the cuttlefish. It's beyond our comprehension, beyond our imagination. So what I try to do here is when I look at these marvels that God has made, what mind could make that? What mind could actually craft that? So it, it's a fearful symmetry in this universe as I describe it. So I see this beauty and I, there's something in us that resonates with it, that we appreciate the color, the diversity, the complexity that God uses and it's, again, as I say, gratuitous. It's beyond what you ever needed for just a differential uh, reproduction. This is far, far more than that. So when we consider then God's world and his handiwork, then well, we can amplify that and begin to see things that we could have never imagined before that are extraordinary. I'll give you one, one more example of this. There's another thing I'd like you to consider looking at. It's the John 1010 project. Very good. Um, it's on uh, YouTube, and it's um, really about the whole area of showing the glory of God in the created order. And one of the things I'm going to show you is this um, hummingbird tongue, this living machine. 
think this is the one, yes. This is a spectacular machine. A miniature robot designed to stay airborne in a controlled environment for up to 11 minutes. Isn't it really impressive? And then you look at this. And come this machine is even more spectacular, and it doesn't require perfect weather, a battery, or an operator to fly 18 hours a day. A hummingbird's aeronautical skills are undeniable, but the genius of its biology extends beyond flight. Case in point, the brilliant technology that fuels one of the highest metabolisms in the animal kingdom, enabling this tireless bird to consume twice its body weight in food every day. The hummer's tongue is thinner than a fishing line, Yet it's designed to rapidly collect and transport nectar with an elaborate system of component parts. Long thought to work like a drinking straw, science has now revealed that the bird's tongue is actually a nectar trap equipped with a pair of narrow tubes that can reach deep into a flower. These tubes are segmented into rows of elastic flaps, each anchored to a supporting rod. When the bird isn't eating, the flaps align to form two chains of closed loops that fit compactly into the beak. But when it's time to feed, the tongue undergoes a dramatic transformation. While approaching its target, a network of muscles and bones quickly extend the tongue to make contact with the nectar. When immersed in fluid, the tip splits and the flaps on each fork systematically unfurl. Then, as the tongue withdraws, the flaps close tightly to capture and seal the nectar for instant delivery into the bird's mouth. The entire process is executed flawlessly in less than a twentieth of a second, thousands of times a day. Superb design like this begs an obvious question. In nature, are such levels of engineering possible without purpose, plan, and a creator to orchestrate every step of the process? Uh, really an excellent way of looking at this, but uh, what, one of the things you see when you're looking at this creature then, uh, it was astonishing. I did not, I did not know that it, that it worked in this manner. Uh, this is recent discovery. We never, no one ever did. They just thought it was sucking it up. No, it's far more amazing than that because it just, it splits in the water and you see how the flaps open up like that? And then they, they, then they close when it withdraws and it just sucks it in, the, the nectar, and then opens it up one, in a 20th of a second, this entire process is done. And so again, as I'm exploring things of this nature and looking at the uh, natural world, and I see what I call the fearful symmetry of the universe, it's from William Blake's Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright in the Forest of the Night, what a mortal hand or eye could frame by fearful symmetry and the, the idea of, God making such marvels and wonders, and we do well then to actually begin to see in this world the glory of the one who made it so that we can have a greater sense of holy awe and wonder and transcendence because at the end of the day then we have to realize that the God we love and serve is a one who is 
both profoundly intimate and profoundly removed. He's incredibly, he's the creator, and we are clay, or they go from there from uh, mineral to uh, vegetable to animal, and then finally to human, but then uh, adopted child, then friend, and then lover. So you have that reality that we see in the New Testament, and yet on the other side of the, side, side of the spectrum, he's beyond our comprehension and fearful and beyond our grasp. So there's a spectrum of intimacy and somehow mysteriously, we are all of these things want, uh, uh, simultaneously. And so when I look at this, uh, this idea of the, um, see if I can find the, and I'll close with this, the, um, marks, rather marks of a disciple here. Yes. Um, I've been teaching on the nine marks of a disciple in my Friday morning study. And one of those marks is this uh, area of passion. And I've come now to see something this year that I didn't, uh, this, in the last year that I didn't see, that actually the love of God and the fear of God are equally developed in Scripture. And if you tell me what a person loves, I'll tell you what that person fears. What do you love more than anything else? I'll tell you what they, you fear. Tell me what you fear, I'll tell you what you love. You see, it's both and, because we must actually come to know that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and it requires this uh, sense of understanding to recognize the greatness of the, law, of the God that we serve. And so with, with this in mind, I think obedience requires both fear and uh, trust, both that he's transcendent beyond our comprehension. Who will not fear him? And look at the creation, or, and the more you look at that, the more astonishing, scary it becomes. You're immersed in profound mystery on every order of magnitude. And at the same time, yes, there's the imminence that he's close. And it's not one or the other, it's a both and. When I'll close with this text of scripture that I've been chewing on, and it's in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 and 29. Since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So we walk with him then in a sense of holy awe and reverence. Lord, we thank you for the time that you have granted us on this world, as in this soul-forming world. May we actually, by your grace, come to know you better and to love you, but also to actually come to grasp your greatness, your transcendent majesty, and your awe. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.